part of what I think is so important about celebrating commemorative months like Black History Month is that they act as the beginning of the conversation, not the end. This is a great way to get people engaged around really important issues and interests within the Black community. And I think people are going to be really impressed with the diversity of films and events and the ease of access. We've worked really hard to make this a really accessible program. All of our events will be available on our MKE Film Facebook page, our Black Lens Facebook page, and our MKE Film YouTube page. So you can go to either of those pages and watch events for free. Our films will be available on our watchmkefilm.org page from February 1st through February 28th. Welcome, y'all. Hey, y'all. Welcome to week two, day 11 of Milwaukee Films 2021 Black History Month program presented by Molson Coors. I am Tiana, Community Outreach Coordinator for Black Lens. For the month of February, Milwaukee Film is dedicating its new programming to films and events that celebrate, honor, and elevate Black culture and traditions. Engage with 30 films and a dozen events that inspire conversation celebration, and community. This week, we turn our attention to representations of Black love and joy. In addition to tonight's conversation, please check out the Black Love and Joy Shorts program and feature films, Olympia, The Outside Story, Somewhere in the Middle, or a one-night-only screening of Sylvie's Love available this Saturday. All Black Love, Joy, and Films and events are sponsored by UWM Social Cultural Programming and Madison 365. Visit mkefilm.org slash bhm for more information and to purchase tickets and passes. So tonight's event, A Black Woman's Worth, doubles as a special live edition of Black Oxygen Podcast, a place to breathe, connect, and restore by hearing and listening to Black folks in this shared journey of life. Black Oxygen is a podcast amplifying Black voices throughout Wisconsin. This special edition features host Angela Russell and a diverse panel of very, very dope Black women examining on-screen depictions of Black love and romance. Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at CUNA Mutual Group, Angela is responsible for leading the development, direction, and implementation of short and long-term strategies and programs that support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Get into it, y'all. I would like to introduce Angela. Hello, can you hear me? Good, I'm glad. I'm so happy to be here. Tiana, thank you for that introduction. No and it is an honor. I'm The reason I said, can you hear me is because I literally just rebooted again. So forewarning for folks, we, I am having some personal technical issues. That doesn't sound right. I'm having some tech issues today. So um, if I go off the screen, the conversation will continue and I will jump back in when I can. I am so honored to be having and moderating this conversation tonight. I'm super excited. Like Tiana said, I am Angela Russell, the host and creator of the Black Oxygen podcast, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this conversation. Um, so before we kind of get into the conversation, you all need to really have a grounding in terms of who y'all be here. you will be hearing from tonight, because the women that we have on this panel are dope AF. So first we have Winter Dunn, who is a filmmaker, and she was the director and producer of Junebug. And Junebug like brought up all of the emotions. I could barely talk after watching it. So I can't wait to have this conversation with you, Winter. We also have Sabrina Madison, the executive director and founder of the Progress Center for Black Madison here in Madison, Wisconsin. Hey, Sabrina. We also have Gina Stevens, the executive director of Rock County Jumpstart and a marketing strategist. Dasha Kelly, the newly named Wisconsin Poet Laureate. Yeah, snap, 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 snap. And Crystal Hardy, a makeup artist. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation. So one of the things that I say on Black Oxygen, we always need to have our candles lit and our incense burning. So I, I lit my candle so we could be on brand. And 
We're going to be talking about black love and a woman's worth and how it all ties together. I'm super excited that I'm the one asking the questions instead of providing the answers. No pressure. Also, no pressure. I heard that our black men killed it last night. So we got to do our part to kill it <laughs> just as much or a little bit more, if that's all right with you all. <laughs> all right. So, Winter, let's go ahead and start off with you. This yeah. movie, June Bug, is amazing. Um, Thank you. And what struck me, if when we were talking about a black woman's worth, what struck me was that notion of how lots of times our worth is tied into our caregiving and how caregiving starts at a young, young, young age. But before yeah. we get into that, can you add, uh, chat a little bit about what drew you to the script and what resonated with you and what did you want the film to portray? Yeah. Um, so when it, it came time to start developing the story, I had several concepts that I was considering uh, making into a film, different things I wanted to explore. And so I called uh, Nikki Davis, who is a playwright, a novelist, a Yale graduate. Um, we've worked together in the theater space for years. And I hit her up and said, look, I know you've never written film but I think you have such a, a rich use of language and a really beautiful understanding of story. Uh, and I believe together we can make something really profound. She was like, I'm down, let's, let's meet. Uh, we met, I told her all these different ideas we had and I don't know how, but we kept coming back to talking about our dads and we kept mm. coming back to our unique childhood stories and the power of music and the way it moves us and, and sparks our creativity and how that is rooted in the way we were raised. And I don't know how, but we left thinking we were going to make a romantic comedy and I couldn't stop thinking about the father conversations. So I called her and said, what are we doing? It's the dad thing. Hmm. Like, obviously, it's the dad thing. It's the thing we keep naturally coming back to, right? Pay attention yeah. to what you pay attention to is what mm -hmm. we always say. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the spark um, we started developing. She started writing. And to be honest, the writing process was two weeks, <laughs> maybe. Um, wow. That's how brilliant uh, Nikki Davis is. Once she has something to hold on to, she goes. And she wrote a beautiful story and I just it, it just inspired me in so many ways and I had so many images flowing through my mind's eye I knew that this could be a powerful story if we just gave it all that we had and I'm, I'm honored to even sit here and for you to be talking about the film back to me it's like okay great we made the right film that was, was the story we were supposed to tell it's incredible so Thank when you. you were coming up with that story were you able to connect the role of caretaking as young girls and how that ties back into what we do as black women all of the time. Yep, I would say, I don't think the idea of caretaking came into the early, um, in our early thinkings of the film, but this idea of black girls having to grow up faster mm -hmm. than the people mm -hmm. around them, that was something that we kept feeling. It was like, uh, Junie is independent for a reason right. because she learned that she had to look out for herself at a very young age. And so in the film, we're with her discovering new information about her dad. And, and that's cementing an idea of like, oh, this is who we are. I didn't know that, right? I thought we were these free spirits, these loving. I didn't realize that I was with you to help take care of you. Mm -hmm. I thought that we were just having a bonding moment. But as I grew up and I started reflecting on my past and reflecting on my childhood from an adult's perspective, that's, I think, when Junie started realizing, wait a minute, I shouldn't have had to sit on the floor and hold my dad at that age. Right. right. At that age, it felt like that's just what we do. But you grow up and you go, oh, I have to now reconsider all of the things I considered normal before I learned better. Right. You don't know better until you know better. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that, it was more of that thinking as we were building upon the story. What did you discover about yourself in the process of creating this? Who? that's a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this film, to be honest, it's, it's, it's a film, it's a healing piece, mm -hmm. right? We love the festivals, we love the, the applause, and obviously we want the film to be shared. But if I'm mm -hmm. honest, this film came out of like a real authentic need for artists to use their pain and their trauma to create something from it, to create something beautiful from it, and to grow from it. So, you know, I learned that 
my past doesn't define me. I've learned that the people in my past, in my family who I thought were just bad people as an adult and as I grow to learn, I'm like, okay, they just had a whole life of experiences that they were dealing with when I showed up. Not to right. say that they didn't have a responsibility <laughs> to parent, but it's when, when you look at your parents as people with flaws and pain and their own trauma, you start to look at them a bit differently. And it goes, right. well, okay, I'm not just blaming you for what I thought you didn't give me, but I'm being grateful for what I did get. And I'm grateful for the woman I have grown into. And at the end of the day, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Right. So, you know, right. that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Oof, that's intense. And do not yeah. make me cry while I'm moderating. Don't make me cry. <laughs> You're asking about what I learned. I was like, oh, my tears are Let me get it together, child. <laughs> right. So, so then Junie grows up and she's trying to remember her story, to put those pieces of herself back together and write it out. And the relationship between her and her partner fascinated me. Because yeah. th it was this notion of submission that when we in in so much of our culture, we're taught that men, that women need to submit to men. Right. If you grew up in the black church, you know that you are supposed to submit to your man. And then you had Junie's partner literally get on the floor with her mm -hmm. so that she could remember. What did that mean? And were you intentionally trying to flip that script on what submission and quite frankly, partnership means. Absolutely, absolutely. From day one, we wanted to push back on the narrative that black women with complex relationships with their dads are gonna grow up with daddy issues. That is a narrative that I oftentimes only hear regarded toward black women. Other cultures cannot grow up with their dad and we don't assume that they're never gonna have a healthy, loving relationship in their adulthood. And so when we were coming up with the character of Calvin, which is her boyfriend, I wanted him, we needed him to be supportive. We needed to mm -hmm. see him in the kitchen making dinner because she's busy trying to work. We needed mm -hmm. to see a black man meet his girl where she's at and say, look, what is it that you need? Whatever it is, I will lay on the floor. I will cook dinner. I will talk with you and help you brainstorm. Whatever that looks like, I'm here to support you while also not making the narrative about him. Because we sometimes do that too. We introduce men and we, we're like, oh, great. That's a great character. Finally, we see a great depiction of a Black man. But then the narrative uh, the focus changes and now the man is the center of the story. And that mm -hmm. wasn't, I was like, this is Junie's story. And these are about the men in Junie's life and how she comes to terms with her relationships with these men. So yeah, having Calvin, I, you know, it was inspired by also our true lives. Like, Hey, I've had beautiful love stories and I know uh, many of beautiful men who want to be there for their partner and they want to be a support system. And, you know, just because her dad wasn't always there for her in the way she thought he should have been, doesn't mean she didn't learn how to respect herself and how to choose a partner who respects her as well. So y'all are completely frozen. I told y'all that I was gonna have some issues and those tech issues are surfacing right now. Um, can you all hear me again? Yes. Yes. All right, great. So Winter, you hit on something really important, this notion of daddy issues. And when mm -hmm. you said that, I'm just like, Ugh, okay, do we, do we really need to talk about it? But apparently something moved you to bring up that phrase. So we're going to talk about it. Yeah. So for this panel and winter, you can start when we think about daddy issues, what, when people say women, black women have daddy issues, what are they not saying underneath that statement? And how does that tie into our perception of our own worth? Mm. Who wants to start? Uh, Winter, do you want to start? And then we can call oh, popcorn. Oh, uh, oh, sure, sure. So I think whenever there's a blanket <laughs> statement about our community and our experiences that is limiting us greatly, and it's completely ignoring the individual experiences of every Black woman on this planet. And so when we say daddy issues and we kind of like cast us off as the, you know, unmarriable or whatever that narrative is, I hate it. I hate it so much because I don't think other women, women of other colors don't always have to 
prove <laughs> themselves the way that I think we feel like we have to. Um, even going back to that like caretaker like narrative, it's like I have to prove my worth here by helping, by doing, by. And the truth is, I am worthy because I he am here. Right. Period. And then what I choose to do next is my decision. Um, mm -hmm. So th that's my thought so far. But I want to open it up to the panel. I've been talking so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a. Good evening, everybody. And uh, we uh, you shared before we got started, just my whole heart wants to explode with all of this glory on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and it's interesting, we start this glory with such a heavy question, but yeah. it, mm -hmm. I think it also runs the so, neat. It runs the winter. What other folks, when you hear daddy issues, oh. go ahead, Dasha. When it runs, a, it runs a thread through so much of these conversations about how we are, how we think we think we're told that we have to um, show up in the world. So instead of daddy issues, why can't they just be daddy relationships, right? right? So what I lo love so much about this film was one of the lines where she said, you know, he's no one is all one thing. Mm -hmm. So no one is all one thing. And what I wanna point out is interesting is these are conversations, habits of conversation that we've also absorbed as somehow fact, mm -hmm. I've had people um, in my single in my single days say, "Oh, what you don't have this 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 has happened to you? I don't know any black women who haven't. Well, mm -hmm. you haven't met us all, and I know plenty was mixed. And I have a wonderful relationship with my father. And I had another person say, "Oh, well, what happened to you?" I had a wonderful relationship with my father. So the mm -hmm. idea that even within our community, it's we want to discuss like an aberration that mm. incredible fathers exist. And we and we have been conditioned in a lot of ways. I always ask my male friends, I tell my sisters, what example did you have? Mm -hmm. So if the example that you had modeled was that as a black woman, my job is to keep everything together. My job is to fix this man. And, my, um, and I have to go into every relationship prepared to be wounded and broken. And, and yes, those folks are out there. Mm -hmm. But where it becomes this one thread of conversation, don't get me wrong, we've all run across these folks. Mm -hmm. We've sometimes been that, that chick, but we haven't expanded the breadth of all of our relationships, of all of the ways that we do and don't show up. And we singularly go back to a um, sadly convenient trope mm -hmm. of Black men, Black partners, Black fathers, and as Black women, we have an opportunity to break to change that. And we, I have found that we can often fall into this, the habit speak way, way, way too easily. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dasha. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go next? Yeah. Sabrina or Gina? Just, yeah, I'll just add um, the whole, like just thinking about what daddy issues are. I like, I lost my dad when he was, I was 10 years old. He was very young. Um, he OD'd. And I didn't know he was using it until I was a dog and kind of like investigated his background. But the thing I remember most about him is caring for me, like pouring into me, like loving me, like being a very, very much sort of like just very loving person and motivated me to read, to take care of myself, you know, stuff, stuff like that. And so I think when he passed, I lost a lot of that in the household growing up with my mom where those things weren't necessarily present. And I was I was made to be responsible for my brothers. And so as I got older, I started honing in on those sort of like feelings and emotions and the care that I got when my dad was alive. And to be honest, it wasn't until I came across Bell Hooks All About Love that I yes. understood the ingredients because mm -hmm. she talks about over and over these ingredients, you know, that make up love. And I could sort of like go back to those ingredients and find those ingredients in my dad. And I think if we're mm -hmm. talking about daddy issues being maybe some of the wrong decisions we made in just exploring ourselves and our relationship with men, I don't think I had honed in on those ingredients before I became sort of an older woman, you know, um, and raising a, a black man and wanting him to be everything he does not need to be in his relationships. And so just going back to an understanding, like what is love? What does it mean to be loved? Even if we're not talking about intimate relationships, and what I realized, I had got those ingredients from love from my father very early on. Um, but because I think of how he passed, 
we didn't people just really didn't think about him as being a loving person so like watching your movie like it just took me back to this um just very like this caring relationship with my dad even though he might have had these struggles i wasn't aware of at the time mm. I love how you said that though. It's like my dad was struggling with his own thing and mm -hmm. still was this loving, tender, yeah. caring mm -hmm. figure in my life. And mm -hmm. oftentimes we mm -hmm. get told, and that's a major part of the film, we get told it's one or the other, yep. right? In this film, it's like, he's an alcoholic or he's a great dad. Mm -hmm. And the truth is he's both and he's navigating yeah. both, right? Yep. And he makes yep. mistakes, but then he also provides his daughter with this magical, loving, creative mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. That's probably the reason she's a writer now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, we just have to be comfortable knowing, like like you said as well, like nobody's all bad or all good. Yep, yep. They just are, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that you use the words ingredients, not just about your, the ingredients of your father, but the ingredients of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's also because at some point, good examples or not, we're making sense of the our surroundings of what motivates us, of what makes sense and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I, but the ingredients it gives you a chance to, like you said, see these people, see the humans around us, and all of their all of their splendid parts. You can mm -hmm. see a situation in all of its splendid parts. And some of those parts have us in it. So mm -hmm. it also <laughs> you know, speaks out to what are, what do we put into, what ingredients are we putting into that? But so much is, I think, how we're introduced to the conversation of love, uh, particularly as black women, um, where we hear that, how we hear that. And of course, all the, the social conversations of how we're portrayed and, um, and how we can be caricatured caricaturized mm -hmm. but at the end of the day what ingredients of love oh, yeah. um, have been enduring yeah. as you go from the the princess i dreams of a little girl to these grown women um some of the ingredients we should have let go of at 12. some yeah. of the ingredients we didn't give ourselves permission to seize on to once we got to 13. so i love that language uh sabrina of the ingredients of love um, and yeah. the people who taught us how to love that yeah. i like a lot it's it's really too while watching so it. Gonna I, know. Oh, go ahead. I know Angela's on a delay. <laughs> <laughs> so one, it really did remind me of crafting a poem though, because as I was watching her mm -hmm. and I was watching her struggle, um, you know, getting him onto the page, it mm -hmm. again it took me right back to trying to uh, talk about this relationship with my dad on the stage or in my writing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's such a powerful piece and over and over again all i kept hearing was bell hooks ingredients of love like over and over again yeah yeah so i i'm, I'm just going to riff off of bell hooks for just a second someone's asking the name of the author in the book uh the book that sabrina is referring to is all about love by bell hooks and i have a different quote for bell hooks as it relates to this next question that i'm going to ask and gina i'm going to start with you um for the for the answer so in her book, Salvation, which is kind of the next book in the All About Love series, <laughs> Sabrina, yes. Bell Hooks has this quote, if love is not present in our imaginations, it will not be present in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of the power, piece of the power of Black film and sharing our narrative of what love looks like in our imaginations, because that mm -hmm. does not happen in white-led films. So many, in, so many, in, I, I don't, I was going to mention Tyler Perry, but we'll just put that in a different category. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in so many films, um, women are seen as the caretaker, the, um, the person who's submissive, the yes woman for black women or other things. And what you are doing, Winter, and other black filmmakers are saying, we are more than that. Women are much more expansive and we're great. But, and, and Gina, I'm teeing you up for this. Um, what is it like to know your worth in a society that doesn't see our full humanity as black women? Um, a I lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that you said? A lot of cussing. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. I, I think that um, for me growing up with a grandmother who constantly made me aware of that, 
as I was growing up of what my worth was and not just what my worth was, but what my power was in being a black woman with, um, uh, with this amazing strength because mm -hmm. you are, you do so many things. Um, when you grow up in a black family, you are a caretaker, you are, you know, um, cause you know, and I, I always tell people when I was mm -hmm. eight, I was standing on a milk crate, you know, doing cooking dinner. Right. And so you're you're raised yeah. to just just to just and when I would always get frustrated about that, my grandmother would just remind me that there's a certain strength in, in that because the things that you're learning as you grow up and what seems to be, you know, those things that frustrate you when you're little, there's gonna be a certain power and strength in that you know, as a black woman. So while you you're, you cuss a lot, of, you know, um, over the years, my grandmother used to constantly remind me that there's a certain power and there's a certain strength in being a black woman that comes with that. So yeah, for me, that's what I've always held on to, no matter how frustrated I, I became over the years, that there's a certain strength in that. And I know there's some trauma attached to that where mm -hmm. we love to hold on to um, all the bad things that happened to us when we were growing up. And we hold on to that and we hold on to that as a badge of honor. Oh, I had these terrible things that happened to me. And because of that, I am this, you know, I'm better for it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's much to be said about that. But at the same time, I think um, we are who we are because of because of a lot of the things that we we have gone through um starting at early as the age of five um, and we see that in your film you know and i think that's a largely a part of i don't want to say largely but it's a part of the formula as to why um june is who she is i think it, it to, at least to me it was a part of the formula mm. that, that led to her strength so at least that's what i got out of it Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. After you, Angela. No, I was, I was just going to say thank you, Gina. Um, go ahead, Winter. Oh, no, I, I was one saying thank you uh, <laughs> for seeing that in the work. Um, and what the question is, so we're, so how do we, is it, is it how do we hold on to our power in, in a society that doesn't view us, the, hu the human in us? Is that the question? Yeah, basically, how do you continue to know your worth? in a society that doesn't see our full humanity. Know your worth and continue to love yourself. Yeah, for me, it's an ongoing uh, process. Growing mm -hmm. up as a black woman and growing up as a dark skinned black woman, um, mm -hmm. I just have been met with a lot, a lot of energy, a lot of aggression toward me for just being myself or just doing what feels natural. And so, you know, in my younger years, I had deep insecurities that I would never, of course, tell because I'm too strong to be insecure and vulnerable. So it was like, I remember my final years of high school, people thought I was so mean and I wasn't mean. I was just ready. I was defensive. I was like, I know you're going to have something negative to say, so I'm going to say it first. Um, mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there are a lot of women who've been hurt and they're just responding from their trauma and then they get labeled as an angry black woman and it's like did anybody ask her why she's upset there might be valid reason um behind it not that that's all that she that all that she is that's just how you want to define her um but for me i'm always actively making a point to see the beauty in myself um i'm always mm -hmm. you know thinking about the stories that intrigue me. And my first, if I'm honest, my first impulse is to disregard them. You go, oh, no one cares. That's not important. Like, you know, find an important thing to say. And I have to always stop myself and go, it's important because I care. Right. I have to teach myself how to love myself sometimes because my mind will go in a tangent, this negative right. tangent that doesn't serve me. And so over the years, I'm learning if it doesn't serve you, release it. Right. Release Absolutely. it. And yeah, and redefine what th the day is going to be for you and who you mm -hmm. see yourself as and who you want to be. And if the world around you won't affirm that, unfortunately, find the power to affirm it in yourself. Read books that makes you see yourself in a new light. Watch read, Listen to podcasts, watch shows, try to find right. images of yourself in a beautiful light. And hopefully one day, you know, you'll start seeing the beauty in yourself as well. Yeah. I've I to awesome. to like sort of like stay in that place to answer the question as well, Angela. I like I like mm -hmm. I always tell people like I'm gonna be a little hood girl until the day I'm not here anymore. 
because the hood sort of like people give growing up in sort of like what other folks might call a rough neighborhood sort of like this mm-hmm. bad kind of idea well like that hood fed me it loved me it affirmed me i got so many shadows i could just walk out into the you know out onto the porch and you get all these compliments they might not all be you know good at appropriate age compliments but you get so much like love just walking out of the house walking to the corner waiting on the bus walking to washington high school so i got so much love there that when i moved into a place like madison you know so very it could be very toxic very racist environment that all of that like goodness that i got at home i sort of walk around with that every day like i don't do the whole like flipping you know between who i am and regardless of like what space i'm in but i think that personally i truly think because i i end up working with a lot of black women who've experienced a lot of trauma at various points in their lives and it's 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 heavy and it's hard for them um and they feel like they're never going to sort of like get out of their their present situation and i think that once black women sort of like have this time to un- to like learn themselves educate themselves about again these ingredients of love and how to give those and in- like give the ingredients to themselves and like mm-hmm. i don't know like plant their own seeds for themselves and not be dependent on anybody else you sort of like you blossom like mm-hmm. i really don't care what nobody said to me it it you know you can you can talk all kind of mess i'm be like you know i'm still good though and so <laughs> i think until we until we have the time and we get the time to sort of like invest in our own mental health our own wellness our overall just just well-being um we might we might it might just be a sort of like delayed journey or delayed process to fully get there you know but we'll get there once we can we have the time to invest in ourselves awesome I'm gonna go on to the next question and maybe Dasha, you can start answering the next the next question. So this next question that I have for y'all is because we are talking about black love and we know um, sometimes it takes us a minute to remember, but we know we're worthy and we know that we're inherently dope AF, right? <laughs> so if we know that, what is it in terms of us in relationships? Why, what is so hard for black women to find mutual love, respect, tenderness, all of that in romantic type relationships? And I feel like I just need to hide under the desk right now because I'm just like, I'm afraid. Oh. No oh. fear, no fear, do not be afraid. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, something that uh, Sabrina said, you know, learn yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of things are swirling in my head. First of all, we we have models and we have love songs and we have all of the possible 3000 versions of movies and media. Um, and we have these conversations with ourselves. And if the conversations that we have with ourselves being pulled from all these different instructives and these different people are about getting to a thing or a place mm. or a profile or a look or status or check the box, do you, so then you find yourself, uh, we can find ourselves gathering up all of the trappings Mm -hmm. that will make us look like we're worthy for love, make us feel Mm -hmm. like we're ready for love, make it, make us process that we understand love, but going through and checking boxes or getting a bunch of certificates as an example, comparatively, is different from really learning a thing, mm-hmm. right? So going to get a thing, get the outfit, get the look, get the degree, get the stuff is different from learning ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's learning uh, everything, romantically, sexually, the language you want to use, the model, the, the examples that you want to follow. And often we, like so many parts of our lives, unfortunately, love also becomes just these steps that we follow, this paint by number Mm -hmm. experience that doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially if we are cast in the, the, the picture of paint by number that we're following, are these profiles, are these um, cookie cutters, are this is what you need to do to be a a badass black woman, this is what you need to look like to be desirable, this is how you want to live, this is what love should look like, Mm -hmm. learn yourself. And we're not encouraged to do that. We're encouraged to follow patterns. We're encouraged to model after, and there needs to be a balance. But 
how do you invite someone to learn themselves? That's one of those uh, instance burning words, right? That's one of those. <laughs> um, and someone who lives in a world of poetry, um, the, the, uh, my husband also, we met through poetry and we go to this international spoken word festival for young people. And so we talk about this young girl, I wanna say she was from California someplace and she stands up and she's among all her peers. And she was like, you know, um, I wanna be a part of this, but I didn't come from this language. Everybody here all, all, all ashe, ashe and shit. I don't, that's not <laughs> thing. But, and there was another piece where these young sisters described um, going out and get natural hair products. Right. And the whole journey of the big chop and learning how and being Nubian. And then the poem turned into, but would y'all sisters still be about my sisterhood if I if I wasn't or if I didn't or when I go back to the block, they don't care about. So there's this this tension between the thing, the advice that we give and the and the information on how to get to that advice. So we've got to be more than words and we got to break it down the way that we're saying, learn yourself. Um, and mm -hmm. love comes from that. And it's not about fixing yourself. I mean, there's some of that, but learning right, right. that instruction is different than <laughs> learn this, this, cook, this uh, outline on how to be the next version of yourself. If any and, of that. I, and I think I want to add that. Gosh, I love how you have broke, yeah. Oh. Oh, you yes. got some delay. You got go ahead. <laughs> and I think for me, because this is this is a really good question. Um, this kind of hit home for me because um, I've been with my wife for twelve years, and it took me up until year eleven to allow her to love me. So I think that's probably one of our issues that's is real. that we don't know how to allow the person who loves us to love us. Mm -hmm. And it was a really like <laughs> this big aha moment for me was that I had to really start to allow her to love me and not fight her every step of the way. And I think that's one of the things that we do is that, you know, all of this trauma and all of this stuff that we go through, um, we don't know how to let people love us, you know. How did you know? Because I'm sure 11 years in, you sang all <laughs> the songs. 11 years in, you made all the pledges. How, what, how did you know that there was a distance between what you thought you were doing and the liberation of actually letting somebody love you? Um, I, I just was laying there in bed one night and we had had this really profound you know, conversation okay. over dinner. And I realized that a lot of the lecturing I was giving her about, you know, uh, our relationship and, you know, why do you do this? And why do you do that? And it was like, you are giving this woman way more grief than you need to be giving her. Are you trying to push this person away from you? You need to just allow this person to love you and stop looking for reasons to cause tension in your relationship, right? That was a whole hour conversation that you didn't even need to have. And it was just this epiphany. And so I just really started to think about the conversations that we have in our relationship where we are really constantly challenging our partners mm -hmm. to prove to us that they love us, right? And it's like, just let this child love you and just enjoy it right and, and the part can, that we control out of to keep ourselves safe but it's still a conversation to control i really appreciate you sharing that out of your relationship i'll share that i also i'm in the second marriage um but this one's a one this one i've turns out i've been looking for him my whole life and i realized i've been able to say i have a i realized i had a narrow understanding of what it means to be safe in a relationship mm. Right. So we think about safety. You go to whether or not he's dragging you down the stairs, putting his hand all of, you know, emotionally, all of those things. Yes. Top first. But if I can't tell you my dreams, if I can't talk to you about the goofy cartoon that I watched that made me laugh, if I can't admit that really foul thing I said to the lady at the store, if I can't share those parts <laughs> of me, I'm not safe with you. 
but that's right. not, um, I never put that under the umbrella of safety. And when I felt that shift, I'm like, that's what was wrong with every other relationship I've been in. I wasn't fully safe. And so again, it's learning what do you need? Um, that's a that's beyond the obvious, right? So I right. learning yourself and the idea of how what are you controlling because what are you afraid of, right? right? Or what do you what can you let go of? And that's what love is. It's a release. It's a it's absolutely they call it falling in love for a reason. And even once you're in love, it's a whole bunch of floating. It's a spinning that still has to happen because you're you're you are literally handing yourself over to another person. And we aren't conditioned, taught, encouraged to do any such thing. Hand over nothing. Um, because we might get hurt and we do get hurt. We have been hurt. Um, and it is not for the faint of heart. So, so Dasha, I just want to follow up on that. Can you all hear me and see yes. me moving and everything? Yes. All right, great. So, um, the thing that I want to follow up on is that notion of protection. So when you all start having those feelings, you know, those feelings of love, what happens to you? Like, do you panic and you're like, ah, I, maybe I should use an I statement, I panic. So I'm curious about what happens to you all, um, to each of you when you start figuring out, oh shit, there's something here. Yeah. Dasha, it's I'm laughing somehow. one, because I'm a, I'm a writer and a poet, it's always gonna be an analogy. So here we go. It's like when you're cooking and you kind of aren't sure you're putting too much salt or not. So you, and so you're not, so that's what it feels like this fear of I'm going to do too much or this fear of I'm not, put, I'm not putting it enough. Um, this is not going to taste mm -hmm. right. Or I don't want to mess this up. Um, and even as it, even being a good cook, you're mindful of how you put this together. So that's what happens to me when I think about mm -hmm. love. It's, it's honestly to be very fair to the brothers. It's the first thought is less about them and more about, Calm down. Because when we want to be in love, ooh, we clown, don't we? When we want to be in love, <laughs> at, a whole nother everything. So my filter was always don't do not do the most. Or if you do the most, do it well. My mama taught me that. Um, and then the, doing that, that filter of making sure he is or isn't, they are, or they're not. But that's my first reaction to love is because I, you know how easy it, you can fall in if, when you want it, when you are built for it. Um, so that's my first thought. And it's easy to you feel like you can, you're getting tricked, like going to get your car fixed. What are they going to, what are they, what's done really, what's really not broken that they're going to charge me $3,000 to fix? <laughs> <laughs> Angela went out again. <laughs> oh, what about well, you? Guess, what do you first think about when you think about love? I always, again, I go right on back to Bell Hooks and I forget what she called it. I can't remember if it's conflicting, but it's like, it's not necessarily like you're falling mm -hmm. in the, this sort of like, not necessarily love, but this idea of the person. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what I think about first. Like, am I doing that or is this something else? And so I, I tend to, um, I, I'm, I'm super extroverted, but I'm also introverted. So like I would want to be by myself for a month to think about it. Like, <laughs> like I just need to really not. You know, I just need to take a month to to figure out where I am at and think about this. You know, we could you know we could chit chat, talk, do coffee, but I need like a month to like go to my bell hooks and think about and really work through this because that's where that's I realize that's where I'm most comfortable. Like reading and learning, educate. Like I feel like I need information before I can sort of like determine where I'm at with things. So. Mm -hmm. so we've got a great question from the audience here. Um, and I, I'm just curious about y'all's re response or thoughts on it. Why is the first response to take it easy versus giving folks a rawest version of your love? Wait, why is the first response? You know, mm -hmm. probably because we all have experiences of not taking it easy jumping like boom and then, mm. so it's probably from experience like the person giving you that advice i would imagine is coming from personal experience right yeah because we ain't young no more right <laughs> <laughs> when we were young we were just like woo, 
let's just do this. And now as you get older, you're just like, you know what, I need to think about this. I remember, you know, like, you know, have got had my kids when I was 19 and 20. So, you know, the older I got, it was like, now when you fall in love, you have, you're getting, ki- you have kids involved in this now. So whoever yeah. you bring into your life, you're bringing them into your children's lives. So now you really want to be sure that, you know, is this love, this, you, you start thinking about, moving in together and marriage and all that. So it's like, where's this going? Do I really want to do this? You know, I've got kids and all of that. So you're really trying to be responsible about it because we ain't young no more. You know, (laughs) at least that's how I felt about it. When my wife was moving in with me, it's funny because when she was moving in with me, I didn't even help her move in. Like, I was like, I want to do this, but I don't want to do this. So I'm not even going to help you move your stuff in. You're on your own. That's how bad it, that's how bad it was. <laughs> I'm on your own. She, seriously. I was like, I want to do this, but I don't want to do this. So I'm not going to help you move your stuff in. You're on your own. That's that's how I was being, I don't know about this. You know? So, yeah. Just want to be cautiously wonder, optimistic. <laughs> I wonder age, I like I think, I age think notwithstanding. Oh no, go ahead, Dash. No, no, I'm just glad that your stuff is working. Please. I know. I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> hey, Chris. Oh, no, that's the internet. That's not your fault. Person. It's all right. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, like, I agree. It's definitely, you know, proceeding with caution. Like, I'm about to be 40 soon, and it's. I'm just. I don't know. I had a friend tell me once, like, a lot of times we get used to being single, um, and you get, you know, a certain type of comfort in being single for so long. And so I think when I do try to get close to someone, I'm, I'm kind of like, do I really want to give up all that comfort that I had when I was single to put myself back out there? And so for me, it is just kind of like proceeding with caution. And then, you know, like you said, too, you know, children are involved. So you have to be more careful. And people are you know crazy. What, I was going to say, you know what else? Was anyone ever encouraged just to like somebody? I mean. I remember talking to some students a million years ago and it was, she was stressing over whether or not to go to the movies. This was here in the city, go to the movies with someone. I'm like, well, just go to the movies with them. I don't want people, I went to the movies with someone. You went to the movies. It's not the same as, you know, you were, you know, on the football field. And and I, and she said, but it was comparatively. So think about it. If you were just able just to like somebody for a while and, and you like them, you don't like them, but we like them. And it's like, oh, and my last name and your last name <laughs> and our kids going to look like. And, and we were conditioned <laughs> little girls to always, this is going to be the one. But there's there's no space in between just liking someone. And, and if it ends there, that's OK. So some of that pressure right. on you better go get and better go find. And now and, and Prince Charming that's a lot of pressure on a first date. I'm not exaggerating. I had a girlfriend who had a shaving kit and men's house shoes for a man she didn't know yet. Ooh. Are, you, are you for real? You heard me. You heard me. That's a you lot. It's a lot. And to that extreme, aren't we encouraged and conditioned um, that that's the goal? And that goes back to learning yourself, figuring out what you like, how to like somebody. But if I meet you for coffee and I'm already, and I'm guilty of it too, we've all done that. So that may be part of why the, to the question, why we don't fall right in. Um, Cause mm-hmm. you've got that speed bump that we haven't been able to just savor liking people. Right. Mm-hmm. So here's yeah, that's a million it. dollar question. Here. Oh, go ahead, Winter. No, please, please. Here's a million dollar question. I think that sometimes I hear that folks think that black women are hard and super complicated and don't know what we want. Can you all talk about what do we want in relationships? Sabrina, you have a reaction, so you can go first. (laughs) It's, it's, I was just saying, I really don't think there's a difference between men depending on like what state or, you know, what part of the country live in, we live in, but sometimes, I just feel more at ease and more relaxed when I'm down south and talking to men and hanging out or whatever. There's like less surprise about what I've accomplished or what I've done. But I don't mm. call anybody that sort of like is surprised about what I've done or accomplished here because he just hasn't met that yet. 
So where somebody mm -hmm. might be like, oh, you ain't never met a woman like this. It's like, I don't think about it like that. He just hasn't had that experience yet. But I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I just, I really like men. Like I love <laughs> men. Men come in, like I love black men. Like if you know me well enough, you know, I absolutely am in love with black men. They come from like all various backgrounds. They got all sorts of strength, all kinds of education. And I guess for me, it's someone who allows, like I would love to end up with somebody who allows me to just be sort of like slow down with you. Like I'm not in a rush to do anything. Let's just slow down, you know, read some bell hooks. If you can kick back with me and talk about some bell hooks or some June Jordan, like you my guy, you know, but if we can't kick it, we can't listen to Flo Millie at night and cold train on the weekend, then it's a problem. I'm not interested, you know. So let, let's just, I feel like, if, I wish I would have taken my time years ago and not been so rushed and just liking, like Dasha was saying, just liking someone, just chilling, you know, seeing where it ends up. Yeah, and it's awesome. funny because I feel like I'm the only person, I never had that bug. Like I never, I was the girl who was homies with all the boys. So yeah. I'm like you, I love men too. And not just in a romantic way. I always felt like I kind of, Feel like i have like this boyish energy about me yes. and as i grow you know what i'm saying and then you yep. grow up and you start looking a certain way then it's some men have a hard time placing you in the role of just a friend without trying mm -hmm. to sexualize you in any way mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. a line i've had to learn a balance my entire life like hold on you my homie but let me just make sure that you know <laughs> that you're the homie so we can be both you know just ourselves yeah. and our friend yeah. yeah. um when it comes to falling in love, I'm the same way. It's like, I've only been in love once. I'm currently in love now. And it is different because it was easy. It was mm -hmm. like so easy. And I'm someone, I'm a big communicator. I, people assume I'm an extrovert, but I'm, also, I'm actually a huge introvert. Like my home space is very important. So if you can come into my home space and find comfort and come with your own energy, I always say, if you let me be me, I'll let you be you. And if that feels like an easy thing of allowing each other to feel what we feel and have to do what we might have to do to clear our thoughts, if I can do that and there's no judgment or expectation attached, then cool. Like, you know, we, it's all good. And that's how it kind of is now. So that that's me and my experience with that. So I'm going to ask you in one word what you're thinking or feeling in one word in just a second. But before I go there to close out, I just want to remind folks that you can go and see Junebug um, if you go to milwaukeefilm.org slash BHM. I highly recommend it. You may want to have a Kleenex or two right by you because it may bring up some stuff. And feel free to follow each one of our panelists on social media. They are on Instagram, on Facebook. Follow them, support their work. And shout out to Gerard, Tayana, Ranelle and Kevin for holding this session down. So thank you all. And in one word, um, we'll do round robin. What do you think about love or what's coming up for you in terms of black love and a woman's worth? Whomever can go first. Hmm. Ooh, balance, balance. Peace. Freedom. Wonder. Mm, nice. Settled. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? I said wonder. Oh. We're going to do like um, Erica Badu and Jill Scott and, and Give a yeah. word to our sister whose internet trying to shut her down. Um, we gonna say her word is um, <laughs> full. Her word is full. What do you say her word is, Winter? Full. Oh, are we all choosing a word for? Um, yeah. we're, we're choosing a word for her because her internet is 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 acting funky. I'm, I'm feeling um, excitement, like fire. <laughs> Just like a, yeah. yeah, knowing Angela, that's my word too. I was gonna say fiery, like knowing. Mm -hmm. them, like knowing. She got that spice. I see it too. Yeah, she does. She does. <laughs> oh my god! Well, thank you all for being here. Continue the conversation on Facebook. We can still have this conversation, just you know, not 
via this restream, but on Facebook. And yeah, thank you all for this panel. Um, I learned a lot and I can't wait to listen to it again. Thank you. And Winter, thank, thank you. you for this movie. Yes. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for all your words and thank you for supporting the film. Thank you so much. Part of what I think is so important about celebrating commemorative months like Black History Month is that they act as the beginning of the conversation, not the end. This is a great way to get people engaged around really important issues and interests within the Black community. And I think people are going to be really impressed with the diversity of films and events and the ease of access. We've worked really hard to make this a really accessible program. All of our events will be available on our MKE Film Facebook page, our Black Lens Facebook page, and our MKE Film YouTube page. So you can go to either of those pages and watch events for free. Our films will be available on our watchmkefilm.org page from February 1st through February 28th.